All right, so this is the video lecture on acid-base physiology. Here's the overview. What defines the pH? What protects the pH? Then we go through acid-base disorders, and uh, we'll put it all together. Okay. As you remember from uh, chemistry class, the pH is essentially um, the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. So what we're really talking about is the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. So normal is somewhere between 35 and 45 nanomoles per liter, and that corresponds to a pH between 7.35 and 7.45. That is normal, okay? The body really cares about pH, okay? Um, as you remember, um, proteins can denature when the pH gets out of whack, okay? So the body needs to keep pH normal for a good protein function, uh, for receptors to function, for cells to function, and to maintain cardiac output, okay? When we get outside the normal range, then we have disorders, when the pH is below 7.35, we call that acidemia. When the pH is above 7.45, we call that alkalemia, okay? And just to give you a sense, you know, uh, the limits of life would be a pH 6.8, okay? So below that, it's not really compatible with life. That corresponds to a proton concentration of 160 nanomolar. And then uh, on the other end, uh, the highest pH we can tolerate is a pH of 7.8, that corresponds to a, a proton concentration of 16 nanomolar, okay? What defines the pH? So this should uh, be familiar to you, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Essentially what we're talking about is a bicarbonate and carbonic acid buffer system in our body, okay? So essentially what we're talking about is how water and carbon dioxide can combine to form carbonic acid, okay? And uh, carbonic acid can be uh, disassociated into uh, proton and bicarbonate. All right, so the hydration of uh, CO2 is pretty slow, and it's uh, accelerated by that enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. And then once you have carbonic acid, it can quickly disassociate into a proton and bicarbonate, okay? So essentially, you can uh, do the calculation um, and say the pH equals the pKa of carbonic acid, uh, plus the log of the base over the acid, essentially. And so the base is the concentration of bicarbonate in our plasma. And then the acid portion is, what's the partial pressure of CO2? And then 0 0.03 is uh, how much of that is ionized or, or dissolved in solution, uh, rather, at a physiologic uh, temperature. And that's about 0 0.03. So once you do the math, right, you say, oh, well, the pKa of uh, carbonic acid is 6.1. Uh, the normal bicarbonate concentration is 24 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, normal partial pressure of CO2 in our plasma is 40 millimeters of mercury. And so what's the, how much of that is actually dissolved at, you know, physiologic temperature? Uh, it's 0 0.03 is the, is the fudge factor there. So this component ends up being a, a, a quantity of 1.3. And so when you add 6.1 and 1.3, that gives you the normal pH. So these are the things that uh, factor into the pH. Okay, it's important to keep in mind uh, these quantities and the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation as we move on throughout this uh, series. Okay, so why do we protect the pH? Well, um, I've mentioned how proteins can denature, uh, cells can uh, dysfunction, and the heart certainly can go into uh, dysfunction uh, outside of a normal pH. But here's here's what really what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. From uh, the metabolism of uh, fats, and sugars. Okay, so uh, from the metabolism of fats and carbohydrates, we produce 15,000 millimoles per day of CO2, okay? And uh, this is considered the volatile acid because, you know, CO2 can be uh, dissolved into our plasma, and then as it's transported to the lungs, it's a gas, and it can be uh, we can ventilate it off. And so because it's volatile, well, this uh, part of the acid equation uh, can be uh, sort of breathed, breathed away. And so uh, that's really important. The other piece is that we generate something that we call the fixed acid, okay? And so this is basically from normal metabolism. And uh, the estimate of how much of fixed acid is produced per day, it's about one mil equivalent per kilogram body weight produced per day. So you know, for the, the standard 70 kilogram person, uh, about 70 mil equivalents are produced per day, in a fixed acid per day. And so this really comes from oxidation of uh, sulfhydryl groups on 
cysteine and methionine uh, to form some sulfuric acid, hydrolysis of phosphoproteins to form phosphoric acid, and, and then also there's incomplete degradation of carbohydrate, fat, and proteins to form some other organic acids. So these are acids that you can't breathe away, okay? So the CO2 you can breathe away, but these acids you can't. And so essentially, whenever you generate this acid, you generate a proton, and we consider this the non-volatile acid, and we have to somehow uh, deal with that. Okay, now the other thing, we're going to lose a little bit of bicarbonate perhaps in our stool, okay, because uh, secretions in the uh, colon and the gastrointestinal tract are very high in bicarbonate. So you lose a little bit of bicarbonate in the stool. And so the net effect is that uh, every day we trend towards acidemia, okay, we're generating acid and maybe we lose a little bit of bicarbonate in the stool. So uh, clinically, uh, we always tip towards acidemia. Okay, here's how we protect the pH. Number one, for the uh, volatile acid, we got to have good lungs and good uh, ventilatory system and you know a good brain that can sense everything uh, to excrete the CO2 that's generated. Next, uh, for that fixed acid, we have to excrete the protons that we uh, generated, and we have to regenerate bicarbonate that buffered that proton. Okay. And then whatever bicarbonate makes it to the kidney, we can't lose it in the urine. We've got to reclaim it. So we have to reabsorb that bicarbonate. Okay. Here's how we protect the pH. All right. Some buffers, ventilation, and the kidney. How buffers protect the pH. Number one, imagine if we just dropped, you know, infused acid into your bloodstream. So HA, A is the anion, and uh, H is the proton, obviously. So it would disassociate. First, we buffer with intracellular processes. So the proton, that H plus, can actually exchange for other um, cations such as um, uh, sodium or potassium. Potassium is uh, one of the big ones. So the proton can move into cells and actually be buffered by intracellular proteins and phosphate. Extracellular buffering can occur through multiple mechanisms. There's bicarbonate, which is the biggest extracellular buffer and also extracellular proteins, phosphate, and then on a more chronic basis, we can actually buffer some of these protons uh, through bone by dissolving bone. I would say the biggest thing to focus on here is the bicarbonate buffer system. Extracellular uh, bicarbonate um, is the predominant um, chemical buffer that we use to buffer addition of acid, okay? Because, imagine this, if we added a new acid, so we have a bunch of extra protons floating around, if we have enough uh, bicarbonate present, the proton and bicarbonate can combine right into carbonic acid, which will rapidly disassociate into CO2 and water. Okay, And now that CO2 can be taken to the lungs and breathed away. And so that is how we can um, buffer that. Now, uh, how much of it is intracellular versus extracellular? Because I just showed you two processes. You know, in, a, in the setting of a metabolic acidosis, it, intracellular appears to have more of a role than extracellular buffering. Whereas if there's an alkalosis, right, um, you know, instead of adding uh, acid, we added too much base to a patient. Um, it seems like extracellular buffering plays more of a role than intracellular. But these experiments were done on dogs. Um, they may not apply to humans, but it's close. Okay, now what about uh, CO2, right? Because remember, we're generating 15,000 millimoles of CO2 per day. Well, CO2, uh, because it's, uh, it's nonpolar, it can move across cell membranes. Fortunately, we have buffering capacity inside of red blood cells, and so CO2 can uh, stick to hemoglobin. And this is great, right? We need to buffer all that CO2 that's being produced without changing the pH too much. So... CO2 can buffer against hemoglobin, and then when transported to the lungs, uh, can uh, peel away and be uh, ventilated off. And then also, remember, we have CO2 sensors in the aortic arch and the carotid body. And fortunately, all these things are in connection with the medullary respiratory center. Okay, So if the brain gets sense that the pH is dropping, guess what? We can increase ventilation. And so this leads to an increased ventilatory response, increased uh, using your muscles of respiration to try and improve ventilation and breathe off that extra CO2 that's being produced. And all this happens automatically. This is a reflex and you don't have to even think about it. 
And so we think about this as the ventilatory buffer because we have the capacity to increase or decrease how much we ventilate in order to match how much CO2 is being produced. Okay, next, uh, let's talk about what's happening uh, in the kidney. So remember for that fixed acid that's generated every day, we have to excrete those protons. And because some of those protons were consumed, we've got to regenerate that lost bicarbonate. And then we have to make sure we don't uh, lose any extra bicarbonate that gets filtered in the kidney. Okay, so here's some facts about the bicarbonate system. So the normal bicarbonate in the plasma is um, somewhere between 23 and 25 milli equivalents per liter. And so, you know, let's just do some math. So a 70 kilogram subject probably has about 330 milli equivalents um, in their body, right? So that's taking into account the extracellular fluid, okay? So uh, that's how much buffering capacity there is in the extracellular fluid. Remember in the diet, um, from just you know eating and being alive, uh, there's about one mil equivalent per kilo per day of acid generation. So for a 70 kilogram person, 70 mil equivalents per day. So every time we uh, generate 70 mil equivalents, we're going to consume about 70 uh, mil equivalents of bicarbonate. Okay. Every time we do that essentially we're going to generate CO2 and water, but that consumed bicarbonate needs to be replenished because we're basically, you know, we're, we're like taking a bite out of our uh, systemic bicarbonate every day just by being alive. And if we had no way to replenish that consumed bicarbonate, we eventually get, you know, uh, acidemic. And just to jump ahead a little bit, that's uh, why people with kidney disease, with kidneys that don't work, that's why they develop acidosis, okay? Because they can't regenerate that bicarbonate that's consumed every day, okay? So that's number one, that consumed bicarbonate has to be replenished some way. And then also bicarbonate gets filtered in the kidney and we, got, we have to reabsorb that, otherwise it gets lost in the urine, okay? So in the proximal tubule, you know, the vast majority of filtered bicarbonate gets absorbed there, um, nearly 90%. And then uh, just a little bit of it gets reabsorbed in the distal segments. Okay, so this is a recap of uh, what we covered in the tubular reabsorption uh, series of lectures and videos. So uh, just to recap, filtered bicarbonate. So here's the tubular lumen, and here's the basolateral surface of the tubule with the peritubular capillary on the side. Remember, filtered bicarbonate gets reabsorbed thanks to this uh, sodium proton uh, counter transporter or antiporter where a proton is pumped out combines with bicarbonate and fortunately because there's a carbonic anhydrase stuck to the it's called the brush border right the tubular lumen surface of the cell okay so it will convert carbonic anhydrase into co2 and water co2 and water can move across the cell or the co2 goes into the cell where the reverse happens now we're able to split uh, carbonic acid into a proton and bicarbonate. Now this proton here can really just cycle for all we care, but really what we care about is that the bicarbonate gets transported out of the cell and it gets transported out of the cell with sodium. The net effect is that we're reabsorbing sodium and bicarbonate, okay? Basically the filtered bicarbonate, if we didn't catch it here, we would pee it out into the urine and then we're losing bicarbonate and that would cause a problem, okay? So we're reabsorbing sodium and bicarb. Now uh, there's a threshold effect. This is just like we talked about with reabsorption of sodium and glucose, okay? So the threshold effect means that at low levels of plasma bicarbonate, so uh, the filtered load of um, uh, bicarb, below a certain level, all of it gets reabsorbed. That's what we're looking at here. So when the plasma bicarbonate is, let's say, 16, we're going to uh, filter a lot of it, but we're going to reabsorb all of it, okay? Now, I like to think of this, um, maybe the analogy is like the substance in a cup model you know as we as we start to fill the cup you know we're going to hold all of it fill the cup we're going to hold all of it fill the cup we're going to hold all of it okay but look at what's happening eventually we hit uh, a threshold and the threshold seems to exist around 26 okay so when the plasma bicarbonate concentration hits 26 and goes higher well now we start to spill over the edge of the cup and what i mean is um, we start to excrete some of that filtered bicarbonate. So when the filtered load uh, gets above 26 millimolar, we're going to start to excrete it. So we can only reabsorb maybe up to that amount. And so um, this is sort of a protection. 
All right, so there's that threshold right there. And um, and the fact that, uh, you know, the threshold doesn't, you know, result in this, you know, uh, abrupt change, and instead there's this slow curve at the threshold, that's called splay, and that just reflects nephron heterogeneity. What about factors that would stimulate, right, would sort of press the gas on proximal tubular bicarbonate reabsorption? Number one, uh, fluid depletion or volume depletion. And I'm kind of putting volume and chloride depletion side by side. Uh, sometimes they can be separated, but typically if you're fluid depleted or low in sodium and chloride, you know, the, the proximal tubule will want to reabsorb as much solute as possible. And if, if chloride's not available as the, uh, the anion, uh, then it's going to reclaim all the bicarbonate it possibly can because, you know, the body would basically want to um, support uh, extracellular fluid volume at the expense of um, the pH. So maybe in this setting, the body's willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to uh, reabsorb more bicarbonate than I really need, even if it causes an alkalosis, because I got to support our um, our volume status. I got to support um, our blood pressure and prevent cardiovascular collapse. So the kidney's willing to sort of cause one problem to prevent an even worse problem. Okay, so so we're willing to reabsorb more bicarbonate um, just because it's the solute that's available if there's not enough chloride, okay? Also, uh, hypokalemia can um, stimulate proximal bicarbonate reabsorption. And if you think about it, uh, let me just flip back real quick. Um, hypokalemia, so low potassium out here. Imagine that. So potassium and protons will exchange for one another, okay? And so... If there is hypokalemia, potassium that lives inside cells will exchange out of the cell and more protons will come into the cell. And so if we're loading the cell with more protons, we're actually uh, providing more substrate for this process to occur. And so it's kind of a, an unintended consequence. In order to uh, prop up extracellular potassium, we pump protons into the cell and that will drive this whole process and it can actually stimulate proximal bicarbonate reabsorption. So that's sort of an unintended consequence. And also um, hypercapnia, so uh, retaining a CO2, because remember, proximal bicarbonate reabsorption needs intracellular CO2. So if there's more CO2 in the plasma, that can also um, move across cell membranes, and uh, that would stimulate that whole process. Also acidosis, which kind of makes sense. I want you to to conceptualize that in the setting of a metabolic acidosis, you would want to reabsorb more uh, bicarbonate to um, uh, counteract and um, sort of neutralize uh, that process. And so acidosis will stimulate it, okay? One of the common uh, ways to cause chloride depletion or even to cause volume depletion is by using diuretics. So the loop diuretics or thiazide diuretics that we've mentioned in other uh, video series, those can cause these problems, any of these problems actually, <laughs> hypokalemia, chloride depletion or volume depletion, and uh, that those are the things that stimulate proximal bicarbonate reabsorption. Now, what the things that suppress bicarbonate reabsorption? Let's just think about the opposites, okay? So uh, volume expansion, you can actually inhibit carbonic anhydrase with a drug, it's called acetazolamide. Um, so if we knock out carbonic anhydrase, now we can't reabsorb bicarbonate, we're going to spill it into the urine. And so um, just think about the opposites. So if hypokalemia stimulates it, hyperkalemia is going to suppress it. Um, hypercapnia stimulates, hypocapnia suppresses, and then um, and alkalosis will suppress it. Okay, so now let's talk about excreting protons and generating the bicarbonate. Okay, we just talked about reclaiming filtered bicarb. Let's talk about excreting the bicarb. So now we're living in the collecting duct and we're looking at um, the intercalated cells. So the big picture is that, remember, if we added acid every day, we consumed some of our bicarbonate by buffering that acid. And so we basically have to replenish that bicarbonate that got consumed. And so how do we do that? Well, the kidney does it by producing a proton inside the cell and pumping it out into the urinary lumen and then producing a bicarbonate and pumping it into the capillary and return to the systemic circulation. That's really it. 
Where does this come from? Well, water and CO2 combine to form carbonic acid and carbonic anhydrase facilitates this. And then uh, carbonic acid will rapidly disassociate. Okay. So if we, as long as we can generate carbonic acid inside of cells, uh, we can dump a proton into the urine and dump a, a bicarbonate back into the plasma and reclaim the bicarbonate that was consumed um, from the buffering process. Okay. So now we have to talk about urinary buffers. We were talking about plasma buffers when we talk about the carbonic acid buffering system, but now we have to talk about urinary buffers. So just follow me for a second here. Okay. Daily acid production. I've already told you this. Uh, one mil equivalent per kilo per day, one millimole per day. Let's just say it's about 70 millimoles per day. We've said that before. If we had no urinary buffers, okay, just, just follow me here. All right. So we produce 70 millimoles of protons. We dump that into the urine every day. You know, I'm just picking a number. Let's say you make two liters of urine a day. Okay. What would be the concentration of protons? What would be hydrogen ion concentration? Comes out to be 35 millimolar. Okay. And I don't know, is that, is that high? Is that low? I don't know. Well, what would be the pH of our urine? If, if <laughs> with that, that's pretty low. Okay. A urine pH of 1.45 is very low. Um, I don't think we'd be able to tolerate, uh, you know, <laughs> physiologically, uh, peeing a solution that is 1.45. Um, if I remember from chemistry class, I think the, you know, the sulfuric acid that, uh, was extraordinarily dangerous, you know, has a pH in that range. So I think all of you may know that, uh, you do not, uh, pee a solution that has a pH that low. Um, you would know it. Okay. So how do we get around this? And, uh, we get around this through urinary buffers. Okay. All right. Back to the alpha intercalated cell distal proton secretion. Remember we have a hydrogen ATPase pumping the proton out. We have a hydrogen potassium exchanger that also uses ATP, brings a potassium in and pumps a, a hydrogen out. Okay. Now urinary buffer is basically, now we need things that are going to uh, essentially capture those protons because we can't have those protons be free in solution because the amount of acid per day would make our urine so acidic. All right. So we have to buffer this up. Number one, we have urinary ammonia. Okay. Ammonia is a ready, it's ready to take up a proton and become ammonium, right? So ammonia is nonpolar. All right. But if you remember from uh, organic chemistry, um, it has like a, has some free electrons that are just ready to form a bond with a, a, a proton. And so NH4 is now positively charged. Okay. So when we go from this thing that's uh, nonpolar to something that's polar and charged, ah, now this thing got trapped into the urine. It can't be reabsorbed or um, so, uh, secreted. It can't leave the urine unless it's actively transported. And by this time, uh, there's not really much transport happening because we're in the collecting duct. So it's going to go right into the toilet. So this is great. So ammonia and ammonium is a perfect buffer for protons. Also, we have a you know class of compounds that we just call the titratable acids, and the biggest one is phosphoric acid. Okay, so uh, this is ready. So this HPO4 with a negative two charge, ready to take up a proton and become H2PO4 minus. Okay, now a little bit, a very little bit of um, secreted hydrogen ions are left in solution. Okay, but the vast majority gets captured as ammonia and phosphoric acid. So these are the urinary buffers that allow us to excrete a lot of protons, but not uh, burn our urinary tract with an acidic uh, solution. Okay. Now let's think about ammonia for a second. All right. Ammonia is produced in the proximal tubule. So we're, I know we're jumping back and forth a little bit, but this is kind of cool. Ammonia genesis happens in the proximal tubule. So as you can see, a uh, glutamine is uh, transformed into glutamate and then alpha ketoglutarate with an enzyme called glutaminase. So glutaminase uh, runs these reactions and generates ammonia every time. Okay. And then we also have, we do have an ammonium sodium co-transporter or antiporter here, but whenever ammonia is produced, it's, it can uh, move across cell membranes. And so ammonia generate, ammonia genesis occurs in the proximal tubule eventually this ammonia can make its way into the distal uh, segment of the nephron and the collecting duct and start taking up 
protons, okay? And then as a result of this reaction, the alpha ketoglutarate can go on to become bicarbonate, which is also reabsorbed. And so think about it, this serves as a, a pretty nice uh, area of regulation. So as you can imagine, if uh, there's acidosis, let's say our pH is very low, let's say our bicarbonate is very low, and uh, we need to get rid of a lot of protons and generate more bicarbonate, well, think about it. If we need to buffer this that filtered proton, we probably need to generate more ammonia. This is a great way to regulate that and increase ammonia genesis by uh, upregulating uh, transcription of glutaminase. Okay, so um, ammonia genesis occurs in the proximal tubule. This ammonia will make it um, to the collecting duct and start taking up protons to become ammonium. Now let's do some math to give you a sense of the relative contributions of each. You know, if we have to generate and excrete 70 milliequivalents of protons per day. You know, maybe about half of that is, is uh, buffered by the titratable acid, the phosphoric acid. Maybe about um, the other half is taken up by ammonium and buffered by ammonium. Maybe there's a little bit of uh, filtered bicarbonate that makes it to the collecting duct. And, you know, that filtered bicarbonate is going to combine with uh, what little bit of protons are there and generate some CO2 and water. And... The amount of free uh, hydrogen ion in the urine is very negligible. It's extraordinarily low. That component is what actually determines the urine pH. So extraordinarily tiny amounts of free protons are there in the urine, um, and that's, that's the urine pH essentially. But if you add all these quantities together, then you end up with about 70 milliequivalents per day. And so if you generate 70 milliequivalents, you need to excrete 70 milliequivalents right? Production has to equal excretion, and that's how you stay in balance. And this is key to, you know, uh, renal function and regulation of, uh, of almost all the processes we're going to talk about. Okay. Now, factors that influence distal proton excretion. So, increasing the distal sodium delivery. So, the amount of sodium that makes it to the distal uh, segments, like the uh, principal cells and the intercalated cells, that will stimulate proton secretion, okay? Things that stimulate uh, principal cell activity, so hyperaldosteronism, uh, the renin-angiotensin-2 system, and also, you know, there's some, uh, some uh, licorice, some uh, original licorice that contains something called uh, glycergic acid that um, has mineralocorticoid effects, so that could stimulate this uh, um, segment as well. And also acidosis should stimulate distal acid secretion, right? In the setting of too much protons, we got to get rid of it. And just do the flip here. So what are things that would diminish the ability to pee out uh, acid or to um, pump protons into the lumen? Well, if we're not, if there's not much tubular flow, it's, it's going to be hard to pump out a lot of protons. If we're not delivering a lot of sodium to those distal segments, it's going to, um, uh, reduce how much protons we can excrete. If we have some deficiency in the urinary buffers for whatever reason, um, and hypoaldosteronism, right? If we're not able to augment the aldosterone system, uh, that will diminish our ability to uh, pump protons distally. Okay, and then uh, the potassium sparing diuretics are essentially medications that shut down the actions of ENAC at the principal cell, and um, and also an alkalosis would inhibit distal acid secretion okay so the reason um, most of this occurs is that remember when enac is re was when sodium is reabsorbed at enac it does make you know the lumen slightly more negative compared to the inside of cells which becomes a little more positive and the more sodium that's delivered there the more that reaction can take place and that stimulates the secretion of protons, as well as potassium, which I mentioned in the tubular transport lecture. So when we say distal sodium delivery, that's kind of a, a key word. I want you to think about the amount of sodium making it to the distal segments. And the more sodium that makes it, the more potassium and protons that get excreted. When sodium, when less sodium is delivered to those segments, less potassium gets secreted, but also less protons. Okay. Now we've talked about the alpha intercalated cell. I got to mention the beta intercalated cell. Remember, the alpha intercalated cell is the acid secretor. The beta intercalated cell is the base secretor. 
and it's really just a mirror image of the alpha cell, right? Instead of um, the proton pump being on the luminal surface, it's on the basolateral surface. So essentially the same intracellular process is occurring with intracellular carbonic anhydrase. We're making carbonic acid, which goes into a proton and bicarbonate. Now we're just pumping the proton into the capillary and back into systemic circulation. And now we have this exchanger here that's pumping uh, bicarbonate into the urinary space in exchange for chloride. So this chloride bicarbonate exchanger allows us to get rid of excess bicarbonate should that occur, okay? So we do have beta intercalated cells to sort of handle the flip side. If we happen to have too much buffer, too much base, too much bicarbonate in our blood, we can always pump it out this way, okay? So the alpha intercalated cell is how we get rid of protons. The beta intercalated cell is how we get rid of base. So I remember AA and the B and the B, okay? Excellent.